Welcome back. You missed all the heckling on the break. Lucky you. No, uh, welcome back to more up north. The, the Democratic Gubernatorial Candidates uh, Forum here on More Up North. Senator Hollis Fritsch is here. He's a, also a 2010 Alaska de Democratic Gubernatorial Candidate. He worked as a roughneck, a roughneck on the North Slope for eight years, left to get his law degree, go figure, uh, and became a prosecutor trying cases in Anchorage, Dillingham, Bethel, and St. Paul. Hollis was elected to the Alaska Senate in 2002 and is the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Hollis and his wife Peggy summoned Denali the year before they were married. So you figured after that it was all downhill? It, no, it was all uphill, <laughs> but it was it was uh, how we knew we were compatible, that's like for how, sure. <laughs> uh, being up there like, okay, what are we gonna, where are we gonna go from here? We're at the top of the world? No, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing 22 years together. My wife is in the audience, and uh, I'd like to thank her because uh, someone this week said that they'd never met a political spouse that's worked so hard. So uh, Peggy French. Absolutely. Well, you know what, uh, and, and I've got lots of questions for you, sure. many of them the same that I asked, sure. Ethan, but I, I was thinking this yesterday, I know that we, were, we all attended uh, Ted Stevens' memorial service, and I was sitting there and, and watching his family come in and seeing the pictures of his family and him and thinking, you know, if you have a spouse in public service or you have a dad in public service, you give up part of them in such a big way that you share them. And they are committed to other peop people, of course, in a different way, yes. but you really, you yes. have to have a pretty remarkable yes. spouse that's willing to share when you're getting those late night phone calls at 10 o'clock going, what the hell's that bill still you sitting know, in your committee? I chose this, you know, I wanted to be in public service. I door knocked and so forth. Um, and Peggy has been there all the way. But you know, they, the spouses and the children don't choose that. But you know, the candidate does, whether it's male or female. Right. And it is difficult. You are in the spotlight. It's it's uh, part of the sacrifice of public service. And and I appreciate you saying something about it. Well, I just I just know it's it, it, it's hard after seeing that yesterday, for sure, up close and personal. So Hollis, when did you decide that you wanted to run for governor, and why did you decide that? It was probably about two years ago. I was, you know, I'm, I'm in the Senate. I've been there eight years. Um, I remember I was in Florida with my mother uh, on the first of July last year when I filed my paperwork and sent in my, my, my I faxed in my little statement of uh, candidacy to APOC so I could begin raising money on the first of July. And it was two days later when Sarah Palin. Resigned. And Did you think that was I don't, easy? I don't connect those dots, but some people <laughs> might, you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, it uh, it began a journey, and, I, and then I flew to Fairbanks on July 22nd last year, and stood in Veterans Memorial Park in Fairbanks and announced my candidacy with Peggy, and and there were people there. Why Fairbanks? You know, Fairbanks is the crossroads of Alaska in my mind. It's a place where you know if you can't resonate with the people of Fairbanks, you know, the university people, the Chamber of Commerce people, the military people. You're not a viable statewide candidate. And then we came to Anchorage that day and Juno the next, so we could begin this long campaign of hitting the whole state. And how hard was it, how hard was it to be a candidate when you're in the Senate? Because there are so many rules on you that there aren't for people that Bob Poe was in the race at that time. Ethan isn't in, in elected office right now. So there were there have been different stipulations put on you than were on them. You know, I knew the rules going in. I accepted them. They, they're working fine for me. I'm not complaining. You can't raise money when you're in Juneau. You can't raise money when you're in the legislature during session. And I, I approve of that. You shouldn't be raising money when you're writing laws. That's bad. So, you know, I did meet and greets every weekend. And I made phone calls and I talked to people in the evenings um, to keep the, the word out about renewable energy, and education, the two big themes of my campaign. And, and it worked fine. My campaign manager would set up meet and greets, I'd fly home. We did five in one weekend, Friday night, Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, fly back to Juneau Monday morning. It's, it's you know, I promised I'd run a positive statewide energetic campaign and I've been trying to do that. Well. I, I know, you, I, I know. I see your social media is like <laughs> every, everywhere, Facebook and such. So, what are some of the things you've been in the Senate since 2002? What are you, what are you really proud of? 
What, what, what were you able to do? Because people often want to know, sure. all right, sure. great, you got elected in your town. Sure. What do you got? Because sure. it's easy to make promises. Sure. Four years in the minority under the leadership of Senator Johnny Ellis, who told me every day before I went to work, vote your conscience. And I'll tell you, that was a nice thing to hear. And then in 2006, we joined the majority, Democrats and Republicans sitting down and working together from the middle in the Senate. First time we've had a bipartisan coalition in the legislature in a long time, and it's worked out very well. It was hard for us to do it. It was hard for them to do it, but we did it. Right. We worked and, together. And you guys put Lida Green in. We shook in. hands with Lida Green, and I, and I promise you that was a, a difficult night for everybody, but it worked out great. You know, it really right. did. She, Lida Green, presided over the passage of ACES, a bill she strongly disagreed with. She voted against it, and she let it happen right underneath her, and that's integrity. That's character. And I was proud to vote for that bill. I was proud to help write it. I was proud to put provisions in there at the last minute on the floor of the Senate against intense opposition. And we were fighting and sweating, and, and it was back and forth, and, and we won a huge victory. And I think that's the biggest one, because it's paying for the things that you and I believe and know the state needs, like <clears throat> renewable energy and education, forward funding education for the first time in Forever, educators have been coming to uh, the Senate and the, the legislature and saying, put our money ahead you know, now so we don't have to do pink slips. We don't have to right. potentially fire teachers. We put the money in the bank. There's a billion dollars right now in the bank for next year's education budget. That's good news. That is, and, and, you, and you're saying the only way that that could have happened is You've got to have a strong and fair oil tax on the, on the books. That's, that's, our, that's our statehood. That's our oil. Wally Hickel and Ted Stevens and Ernest Gruning and Bob Bartlett, they fought for that at statehood. They knew this state would need what to rely on its own, own two feet, our resources. That's how we stand on our own two feet, is take those resources and turn them into something good, like universities and teachers and green energy and you turn that into something good and build a great state. It seems like a lot of Alaska is kept in a state of poverty because of energy. And, and in, a, in a state that is so wealthy. You know, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to travel. I was on the VPSO task force. We went to Imanic. We went to Mountain Village. I went to Gamble in Savunga on St. Lawrence Island. I saw the padlocked public safety building on Savunga, and I was there with one of the chief troopers in the state, and he didn't have a key, and no one did. And it was a horrible, horrible image and a metaphor for what's wrong with rural Alaska in so many ways. And, uh, you know, we worked on that. We worked on getting VPSOs a raise. But, but it all boils down to energy you can afford. Can you afford to live in rural Alaska? Can you afford to live in Fairbanks in the winter? Can you afford to live in Spinard? I spoke to a woman last night who said, you know, after I told her, look, renewable energy will lower your home heating. That's how I lower your home heating costs. She said, we need that. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we do. And it was just good to hear. Right. And, and what it would do to stimulate the economies in rural Alaska, too, to have affordable energy and to have that, that independence sure. from having to, yes. to fly in diesel or barge in diesel, when you're having to use fuel to get fuel. It's Exciting just, things are beginning to happen there. You know, in Bethel, um, waste heat, growing gardens, growing vegetables, reducing not only the waste of the heat, but also your transportation costs for feeding your family, growing potatoes in the soil in Bethel. That's good news. There's things happening out there. We just need to feed it. We need to be stronger. We need to lead instead of, instead of following. And I'm, I'm very passionate about that. So what do, you, what do you see as priorities? Like, I mean, you were, you were saying energy. Renewable you were saying energy. Right. Renewable energy. Just take our oil and sell it to somebody else. Let them buy it. And use that money to invest in renewable energy projects around the state. Hydro and Southeast wind and geothermal here and we're doing that we've invested in wind at fire island we gave a we passed this great bill for geothermal tax credits it's going to begin the process of developing mount spur for geothermal it's happening now we've begun to make steps we passed a huge resources bill this year we talked about it earlier 
and I saw Chris Rose, and, and if you're into energy in Alaska, you know Chris Rose, and I bumped to him in the street in, in Juneau, and I said, how do we do, was it a good bill? And he was like, yes, yes, and it was good to hear that what we'd done was meeting approval with, with energy leaders. Right, and not just, um, you Oil know, company guys. Not just oil, oil company guys, and I, I really, I don't understand um, the argument that you can't that you can't have both, that you're against development if you're for, no, no, for green no. energy, because it seems to me that not only do we have more independence, but the jobs that would come to Alaska in, in between weatherization and, and green energy are tremendous. Yes. You know, you make a space in which business and families can thrive. How? Affordable energy. You don't price living human beings out of their homes because of the cost of energy. And, and businesses, likewise, can, can do business. They can move goods. They can transport goods. They can produce goods with energy. And then what? Give them intelligent young people to go to work for them. Out of your school system, UAS, UAA, UAF, produce intelligent young graduates, or through vocational education. If you've ever had a plumber to your house recently, you know you can earn a strong living as a plumber. But you've got to have the tools. You've got to be able to measure, cut. You know, right. know the codes. You can't just, you know, hack your way through it. It's Otherwise, like you're going to be calling another plumber. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> to clean Two it plumbers. up. Two plumbers, right. Right, so there's, there's more than one answer, certainly, for, for people in this state. Renewable but. energy, education, and pound that, pound that, pound that until we get somewhere. And it's not going to happen overnight. You don't, you don't educate a child overnight. I'm, not until we get the wiki chip. I'm looking <laughs> for one. If you, if you see one. Uh, we've got to run to a break. We're going to come back and ask Senator Hollis French some questions uh, regarding this campaign and the election that's coming up on Tuesday. Do not forget to vote. We'll be right back.